today. Our speaker is Anton Suslov from uh, University of Bath in United Kingdom uh, with the topic of pot elasticity in uh, soft active solids. So, so feel free to ask some questions during the talk and also feel free to make a discussion afterwards. So I suggest to move very extensive questions to the end of the talk. You may also ask some questions in the chat. So Anton, please, you're welcome. Thank you so much for the introduction, Maxim, and uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, speak at the uh, theory seminar. Uh, so uh, uh, my topic on autoelasticity is very much a theoretical topic. As far as I know, no one has uh, realized the, th these phenomena that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but uh, in uh, a very brief summary, these, uh, uh, the ideas that I'm going to present to you can be summarized in this uh, in this picture, what you see is some sort of uh, an elastic solid, right? This uh, little square uh, that it starts out as, and you deform this solid in some sequence of deformations. Here, the important thing is that the sequence of deformations encloses some area in what's called strain space and deformation space. And at the end of the sequence of deformations, the solid does work on its environment. Right, that's uh, 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 the new feature that's unusual because, of course, equilibrium solids can never do this. Right, the solid has to have some sort of an energy source inside of it for you to be able to extract this energy as work. So, to begin with, I want to int <clears throat> introduce to you a uh, uh, much more broad field of active matter, which generally refers to materials that have some sort of a source of energy inside of them. And uh, uh, there are a few sort of canonical examples of uh, active matter. I'm going to present to you a couple of uh, uh, videos of things that are a little bit unusual. So for example, this uh, uh, first video is the so-called elastic Leidenfrost effect, where what you see is uh, a bunch of particles being activated. In this video, they're activated by heat. Right? And uh, what heat does is that it evaporates some of the water in these spheres. So these spheres are made of a material called hydrogel. It's 99% water. And when the water touches the surface of a very hot frying pan that you see in this video, the frying pan is well above the boiling point, you have a little explosion of steam and the steam propels the sphere up and you see that it moves continuously. There's a, a continuous energy source provided by the heat here. Um, another example that's, uh, that's very different is uh, uh, this uh, idea of uh, an acoustically levitated uh, material that again has, uh, has active forces inside of it due to the sound field, right? So what's going on in this video is at the top, you have a, uh, an acoustic transducer. So it's a speaker for ultrasound. And at the bottom is a heavy plate. So although it's a reflector. And between the transducer and a reflector, you have a standing wave. You have, in fact, several nodes of the standing wave. And then the bottom node, what you see is the floating of several particles as particles are picked up and floated, they're uh, 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 fairly small, about a millimeter in size, but they're macroscopic. So in particular, all of the motion that you see in this video is uh, due to the sound wave, right? Due to the sound wave activating these particles. This is not thermal motion. And so this is an equilibrium system where you can study these active fluctuations. And finally, another example of a material that I, I won't get uh, uh, to talk much about, but that is a more traditional example of active matter, is this uh, ch microfluidic channel. So now we've uh, uh, scaled things down even more. You have a, the whole of this material being about a cent centimeter in size, and each of these particles is on the order of 10 micrometers. They are uh, just above the uh, uh, threshold for Brownian motion. So they, uh, uh, they don't have any Brownian motion because they sit on the surface. But uh, when you put an electric field um, in this 
system, which is what you see here, they start to move in a self-propelled way, right? The particles tend to go forward in a particular direction and they tend to keep this direction until they collide with other particles or with the boundary. And so this is an example of a self-propelled particle system. Moreover, the neighbors tend to interact due to the collisions and due to hydrodynamic drag um, and align with their neighbors. So not only do you have some sort of input of energy from the electric field, which by the way is sort of out of the plane in this example, but you also have um, a collective motion that comes about from particle interactions and you have this uh, uh, steady state where all of the particles within a single circle within a single ring move together but then the neighboring ring move counter to one another because there's a gear like effect so again i won't get to talk about uh, why i think this material is really interesting this type of active fluid is really interesting it has uh, what's uh, what are called topological states uh, what I want to do instead is to give you some examples of how, when you inject energy at the micro scale, you, you may get you know unusual phenomena such as persistent motion or this uh, you know spontaneous flow in a fluid. Anton, may I ask a yes, two question? So it seems that the symmetry between clockwise and counterclockwise motion is broken, right? Mm. So yeah. is it broken by electric field or? No, it's, uh, well, in this case, it's spontaneously broken, right? There are two sort of steady states of, uh, uh, there are two steady states of this material, right? One, this one, and one with the opposite chirality on every ring, right? And uh, uh, so in this case, in this specific material, it's broken spontaneously. So you could break it explicitly by, breaking the chiral uh, symmetry of one of the rings, right? If you put a little notch or a little, you know, inclusion into the ring, then you can bias it to go one way rather than another. Um, uh, but in this case, it's uh, completely spontaneous. The electric field comes out of the plane, so it actually, it has no preferred directionality mm -hmm, within mm -hmm. this material. So how does it happen that your electric field, which is out of the mm -hmm. plane, provides energy for the motion in the plane? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is a very good question and it's a very, uh, it's a very deep one uh, uh, that uh, you know, people have been studying for, uh, for quite some time. So this is an effect called the quinky rotation or in this case, quinky rollers, right? Uh, so what happens is that you have uh, a, uh, um, can I pause this? Um, uh, so what happens is that you have an electric field um, uh, out of the plane that induces charges near near each of these particles. So each of these particles is a sphere, and uh, it so happens that the spheres the spheres are dielectric, while the you know the solution the water is conducting. So the charges that you get on the dipole are actually opposite to where the electric field points, right? So you have, uh, uh, when you uh, turn on the electric field, you have an anti-parallel configuration where electric field is up uh, and polarization is down, and this is an unstable configuration. So each of the particle, uh, for a strong enough electric field, each of the particle will want to tilt in some direction. And this is sort of, this is the spontaneous breaking of symmetry. It needs to figure out a direction to tilt in, and then once it starts to tilt, it will continue to rotate, right? You have the electric field reforming this dipole and at the same time, the tilting sort of happening continuously. So you start to rotate around some axis in the, inside this plane, right? And uh, uh, that uh, tells you which direction the particle will move in, but once it starts to move, it will persistently move in, in that direction. So hopefully that gives you some some ideas. You can uh, look. You know, there, there's a lot more details of the experimental system that uh, I didn't get a, a, a chance to go into. But uh, uh, our co-author Denis Bartolo, sort of uh, 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 one of the experts and one of the people who developed this type of active matter, um, and uh, uh, it's from his lab that uh, we've taken these images. All right, but. Uh, 
uh, let me let me move on a little bit to to another example of uh, or other example of uh, active uh, materials. So another type of active fluid that you can imagine is taking a bunch of bacteria, right, and just putting them together in a dense fluid. And so here you can't see the bacteria in this film because they aren't imaged well. What you're imaged, uh, what's imaged instead is this gear, right? And what you see in the gear is that it's, it's, a, it's just a piece of plastic, right? But what you see in this video is that because of the bacterial motion, essentially because the bacteria get stuck inside each of the uh, notches in the gear, when they, when they swim, they tend to preferentially rotate the gear in one direction over the other. And so this, uh, this is perhaps a very natural consequence of the fact that you have activity at the scale of a single particle that uh, you can extract, then work out of the active material on a much larger scale, right? So um, this is perhaps one of, the, uh, one of the most interesting uses of active matter that you could envision in the future is taking a bunch of you know, molecular scale or cellular scale components uh, putting them together inside of this fluid, and this fluid will power some sort of an engine, right? It will uh, move some sort of a machine, and this is sort of an, an experimental demonstration of it. You can see that, you know, this gear has a lot of torque on it because, of course, the scale here is so small that there's no inertia, right? Every sort of any uh, rotational velocity that you see here is proportional to the torque divided by some uh, dissipative constant. And of course, another example that uh, we're much more familiar with uh, for um, using little uh, active machines to, to do work, to extract work, is how all work was done before the Industrial Revolution. And this is muscle tissue, right? So this is a, a photograph uh, taken under a, mi a microscope of a muscle. And what you see here primarily is this uh, uh, are two uh, mo molecules uh, combined together, actin and myosin, or together called actomyosin. Um, uh, what, you, what you see are the long muscle fibers along which this uh, actin is oriented. And then these stripes are actually the parts of the muscle that, uh, that contract when the muscle receives a single a signal to do work. So all of the work that you know that uh, uh, animals perform is done through through this mechanism, where you have molecular scale constituents, these molecular myosin motors that consume energy in the form of a, another molecule, ATP, and they drive the uh, uh, muscle to contract under uh, uh, under some sort of a signal. And again, here you have a, this sort of collective effect where you transduce energy from the microscopic to the macroscopic. Um, so this is, uh, this is a zoom in for how, how it works. So you have this uh, uh, actin fiber here, this uh, myosin motor, and another uh, actin fiber here. And uh, when the motors have energy, the way that they perform work is to shear the two actin fibers against each other. So this fiber goes this way, and this fiber goes this way under uh, the motion of, uh, of a motor. Um, so this is one example. One of the things that you'll notice about muscles is that they're not fluid in any sense, right? All of the other examples I gave you are fluid, but of course there are, there are lots of other examples that are artificial that you can uh, make that uh, where you have a combination of activity and, uh, and a solid, uh, some sort of a crystal, for example. So this is a crystal of rotating particles uh, where each of the particle experiences a torque, but due to interactions, they organize into this uh, hexagonal array, and you, you could imagine that this acts not as a fluid, not like uh, uh, these systems, but instead as a solid. 
And uh, so one of, one of the interesting things here is that, as I said, you know, for a fluid, one of the many ways that you can picture or quantify activity is by looking at how much work you can extract another one is by looking at the flow, right, at the pattern of motion in the fluid. But for an active solid, you don't necessarily have this capacity to image it and to say even that it's active, right, let alone quantify the degree of activity. So by taking the video of a solid, you won't necessarily get to, uh, to see how much activity you have. However, this idea of work extraction, right, is something that can be easily translated between fluids and solids. And so that's what I'm going to, um, to focus on. And I'm going to focus on a very specific, simplified system for work extraction that I'll show has a, a, a few really interesting, unusual properties. Um, these uh, uh, properties I'll characterize, I'll describe in general as autoelasticity, which is a, a sort of a, what, uh, what is described in this uh, uh, citation here. So what we would like to do, right, uh, like uh, I described in the very beginning of the talk, is to take some sort of a path and deformation space of a solid and to see how work can be extracted from it, because that allows us to quantify this idea of activity inside of the solid. And we can do, this seems like a difficult thing to do in a solid, right? You need to, uh, to describe its elasticity, but I can um, explain this in a much simpler way by looking at a single spring, right? You can think of a solid as being made out of many springs and we'll get to that. But first, let me think of a single spring, right? So how do you take a spring, right? Take it on a path in deformation space. Here, I'm going to fix this part of the spring and deform it in a, in a cycle here, right? And get some energy out of the spring. Of course, again, you know, the, the key is that the spring has to have some sort of a motor in it, right? It needs to be able to do work on its environment. But even then, you know, the question is what sort of model for the spring can we build? And uh, so the, the idea, of course, is that the work inside of the spring has to be path dependent. It means that there's no potential energy that you can assign to the spring, right? The, uh, uh, the potential uh, is not well defined here. But I'm going, and so you can do this in, in many ways. I mean, uh, for example, if you're only interested in putting energy into the spring and not taking energy out, you can just add, you know, dissipative velocity dependent forces. But I'm going to sort of strip down the problem even more and I'm going to say I don't want to introduce any forces that depend on anything other than position. Right? So I want something that's non-potential, non-conservative, but also that uh, where the force only depends on position. And uh, I can write down such a force, right? It's uh, quite easy. Here, I'm, because it's a spring, I'm going to write out a force that's proportional to the deformation of a spring, right? This is what this uh, delta R means. But, uh, so you have a force proportional to the spring strain. And if this force were to act along the spring direction, right, this is this part. Um, this is just Hooke's law, right? This is a normal spring. And of course, you can derive this force law from a potential energy. You can never extract work from uh, such a spring. If you take the spring into a closed cycle, you will end up with the same amount of energy as you started out with. But there's this other component to the force, which you can clearly see does not come from a potential because it doesn't act along the direction of the spring. There's nothing, no gradient that you can take, which gives you a, a function that's of the form delta r times phi hat, where so, so r hat is along the spring, but phi hat is the perpendicular direction. So this 
Uh, term is chiral. You can see it distinguishes between, you know, up and down for the spring between clockwise and anti-clockwise motion. And uh, there, there are a few names for it. People have written down these force laws. One of them are uh, where, uh, which have been examined in the context of uh, a sort of optical forces or so-called curl forces. So sometimes is that this is called a curl force because it comes not from a gradient, but from a, well, because it has a non-zero curl, right? If you take a, a, a curl of this uh, um, uh, force law, you will get a, a non-zero answer. And uh, um, it turns out that if you put in a, an optical vortex uh, uh, onto a particle, the uh, optical uh, forces that the particle will feel will have this form. This is something that uh, Michael Berry in Bristol has worked on and has explained to me. Anton, may I yeah. ask, it's just very beautiful, but a little bit new for me yeah. at least. So basically you say that if you squeeze the spring, it will not stay on the same line, but it will kind of bend either up or down, right? Yes, yes, there will be a, I can, you can think of it as being a torque on the center of the spring. Okay, but then I could say that, okay, let me, I don't know, add some line so that it moves not only in one dimensional, but okay, how can I? Well, I'm, okay. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do the full oh, okay, cycle okay, now. Yeah, okay. let me, maybe in a few slides, you can, uh, you can try to ask this question again and see if it, Okay, okay, um, okay, okay. So what I was going to say is, okay, so let's, let's go through a cycle of deformations of this spring, right? Uh, so in order to do that, actually, I'm going to start out with something very simple, which is, you know, delta R is equal to zero. And there we know that there's no force, right? Now I'm just going to rotate the spring, right? So there's no force and I rotate the spring, it's free, right? There's no, uh, there's no work being put in, no work being extracted because there are no forces on the spring. And then, but then of course I can change delta R by putting in some potential energy, right? I'm gonna pay an energy cost in order to extend this spring. And what happens when I extend this spring, of course, there's a restoring force along the spring direction, but now there's this extra curl force term, right? And what this curl force term does from the point of view of the spring is that it um, uh, adds a force component perpendicular to the spring direction right? here that uh, now you can do work against, right? So once you rotate the spring back to horizontal, right, you've, you've rotated it back, but now through this path of the cycle, right, you've extracted energy from the spring just from this non-potential term that you didn't put in, right? That's more energy that you've put in. Of course, there's, already, there's some potential energy that you put in to extend the spring, but that you can get back completely just by contracting it back to its starting point, right? So after this full cycle of deformations, right, you have, you know, you have this one segment that's free and these two segments where you've uh, extended the spring and where you've contracted the spring and uh, uh, no, so no net potential energy cost uh, uh, has been put in, but there is this, extra fourth segment where when the spring is uh, extended uh, you've been able to do work on the environment because you've uh, rotated the spring along the direction in which you have uh, force being exerted. Sasha does that uh, answer answer your question? Uh, well I, I, I think I had even a more more stupid question. So, uh, if I don't apply a motor, uh, so but now it's kind of obvious that if I don't apply some energy to the particle, such force is will never happen. So, in conservative system, this K zero is zero. Okay. Yes. Yes. In conservative systems, it has to be zero because uh, 
there's no potential energy from which we can write out this term. All right, so let me move on to sort of two realizations, right, uh, of, of the first of this spring. So as I mentioned, that there, there hasn't been a, an experimental realization, although uh, we had a few ideas that uh, we had proposed. And uh, if, if you look at our paper, there are even nicer pictures of uh, uh, some of these ideas. The very basic right, model that I just presented to you is that uh, depending on whether you extend or contract the spring, there is a torque that acts on the spring center of mass. And you could imagine creating this either somewhat artificially with a sensor and a motor, right? So the motor exerts a torque, but this torque is then proportional to how much you've contracted or extracted the spring. So you need a sensor to sense uh, this force and then feed it back to the motor. Or another example is this idea of, uh, uh, of valves, or you could imagine uh, fans, uh, you know, propellers uh, attached to the spring that's then, you know, inside of a, of a fluid. And uh, depending on how much the spring is extracted or contracted, you either open a valve or um, you uh, uh, rotate a propeller such that it exerts a force proportional uh, to, uh, to the spring extension or contraction. All of the, uh, as you can see, all of these systems are fairly artificial because this is, this is sort of the idea of designing metamaterials, right? We started out not with you know, a material that we're trying to describe like a muscle, but uh, instead we try to start out with a model and that we're trying to build it up into a material and we need these artificial components this as far as we know, because no naturally occurring materials have so, this uh, property. Anton, very, very stupid question. Uh, if you just have a molecule in mm -hmm. a transverse magnetic field, so you yeah. have two charges, plus and minus, and mm. if you, uh, how you say, if you contract your spring, then you get polarization, but then there is magnetic field which kind of bends uh, or acts as your transverse shift or magnetic uh, field will not will not so, help so, anyway. so the no uh, i know that you know you can have uh, um right you can have uh, lorentz forces due to the magnetic field which are uh, you know are proportional to the velocity right here the tricky thing is that it's sort of it's proportional to the to the extension or contraction instead, right? It's not a it's not a velocity dependent force, uh, but but there may be. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some sort of magnetic realization as well. It certainly has the right chirality part, right? Okay. Um, so I'm not going to talk uh, much about uh, about realizations of the spring, although I think it's a very interesting topic. Um, I just don't have very much more to say about it. Instead, what I want to talk about is what happens when you put these springs inside of a material. Right? And so this is what we usually think of as a solid, right? It's a bunch of masses connected by springs. Usually we think of these masses as being atoms, right? And the spring being interatomic interactions. But from the point of view of a metamaterial, we instead think of much larger scales, right? an active matter system. These could be you know, either large sort of molecules and molecular motors that have been somehow designed to have this, uh, 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 this unusual uh, spring force slot. Or even a larger scale, you have these macroscopic constituents, you know, electric motors or uh, propellers uh, attached to um, uh, to each spring that uh, give you the desired force law. And of course, the nice thing here is that we can translate the force law of a single spring into the mechanics of the solid. And let me, let me go through very briefly about how I go about thinking uh, uh, through this. 
uh, so you translate from, you know, from mechanics, from classical mechanics to the theory of elasticity. And the way you do it is that you have this relative displacements of the spring, this, uh, this delta R, which tells you, you know, how much the uh, particles displace relative to each other, right? If each particle displacement is this vector U, then in a continuum theory, you can describe all of the particle displacements by this strain tensor Uij, which is a symmetrized version of the gradients of U. Right? So U is a displacement. If you displace everything together, so there's no displacement gradient, you don't expect to, it to cost any energy. You don't expect there to be any, uh, any restoring forces. Right? And so you don't expect there to be any elasticity. Instead, the elasticity depends on the strain tensor, which are the gradients of this U. And then uh, the other counterpart to classical mechanics are, of course, the forces. And again, you know, like displacements are vectors for a single particle, forces are also vectors for a single particle. But when you look at forces between particles, you describe everything as a strain tensor sigma ij. And the idea is very simple that the gradients of this sigma ij with respect to i, so let's say di sigma ij, gives you a vector. And that vector is a force on uh, a specific particle or a region of your material. So this is a way of uh, uh, describing a collection of many, many springs while sort of keeping track of what the forces and displacements are. And so now I want to go through the same logic that I did for the spring, but for this material. And now the, the only difference is actually not the, uh, the conceptual cycle in, uh, uh, in deformation space, but rather the more involved mathematical description. So um, if you look at the, the mathematical description, if you want to write down the work that a uh, solid performs on its environment, the way that you would do it is you know, by integrating the forces dotted into the displacements right, of all of the spring. Right? And that, that's, you know, if you have a discrete model, you could imagine summing up over all of these springs. But if you have a continuum, description, it's easier to go with the strain uh, tensor, right, here u, dotted into sigma ij, the stress tensor, and integrating the stress over the displacement. This is essentially the same thing as saying f dot dr, right? And so here, in order to provide us a clue for how work might be extracted from the solid, what we can do is to rewrite this using uh, Stokes' theorem, right? Stokes' law. And what I do here, so this is a wedge product that keeps track of epsilon ij's. I, I don't want to think about indices too much. But what I've done is to transform this integral over a path in displacement or strain space, right? into an area integral, into a double integral that's uh, uh, over uh, uh, both the stress and the strain. And now I can transform it again into, uh, into a form that lets me interpret this picture of work extraction that I showed you in the beginning by just uh, uh, rewriting this differential and stress in terms of the derivative of the stress with respect to the strain. And this is a very general formula. Right? Uh, one of the nice things here is that I haven't yet assumed any sort of theory of elasticity, right? I haven't told you what the relationship between stress and strain is, which is where all of the mechanics of the spring is. And now we can think about what, what is necessary, right? What sort of form does this derivative of the stress with respect to the strain need to take in order for work to be extracted, right? 
So, Anton, this red thing is kind of a generalized stiffness, right? Uh, yes, yes. Is it's this a general... your normal material or your yes, modulus? It... Or... Yes, yes. So this is what I'm going to talk about is how, okay. uh, uh, you know, so for another, for a normal material, right, uh, uh, the logic is that this has to be zero because you cannot get work by having a closed cycle and strain space. Right? And so what, you know, the parts where this is non-zero are the special, uh, you know, the, the new special moduli that we associate with odd elasticity. Right. Uh, so there too, so, uh, so odd elasticity is, uh, is this description, right? I'm going to focus I'm going to make a few simplifying assumptions now, essentially about the form of this stress-strain relation that are described well by the spring model, but it's not a, it's not a, a very general uh, spring model, right? And uh, the, one of the basic ideas is, of course, we, like in the spring, we didn't introduce any degrees of, any extra degrees of freedom. We, don't, we consider forces that are only dependent on position and say not on, uh, you know, the, um, the velocity of the particle or some extra, you know, field that you've introduced in the problem. Uh, here too, we're going to uh, imagine a uh, elasticity theory where we only look at the strain and not on things like the strain rate of the material. And uh, uh, the question is, you know, what uh, what property of this material lets us extract work, for example, from this cycle, right, of, of uh, deformations in shear space. So as, uh, as Sasha has uh, pointed out, right, this derivative of the stress with respect to the strain is a, uh, is a stiffness modulus, right, it's a constant if you assume a linear theory of elasticity, right? So this is one of the assumptions that I'm going to stick with from now on, is that this uh, derivative, which in general could depend on all sorts of things, you know, strain rates or extra degrees of freedom, uh, as well as, you know, on the strain itself, if you have a nonlinear elasticity, I'm going to ignore all of that and imagine that this is a constant, uh, you know, for, uh, for the system that I'm considering. Um, and uh, um, the way that, you know, the way to rewrite this right, is of course to say, well, if this is a constant, I don't need any of these derivatives here, right? I can just say that the stress is proportional to the strain with some, uh, with some constant in between. And this is just another restatement of Hooke's law. Um, that you know, forces are proportional to displacements, right? Stresses are just a way to encode the forces, strains are just a way to encode displacement, and this is a way to encode, encode the spring constant. And so now you could imagine, well, starting out with a very general description of this stress-strain relation, right? And decomposing it into two parts. A part that we're all familiar with that turns out to contain all of the usual elastic moduli like Young's moduli or shear modulus, bulk modulus. And we will call this the elastic um, uh, spring, um, a stiffness tensor or the even stiffness tensor. And then an extra part that will encode all of this information about extracted work which we'll call the odd elastic tensor. Right? And so the difference here right, is in terms of the symmetry properties of this tensor. Right? So in passive elasticity, when you say that uh, the uh, uh, stress-strain relation can be obtained from a potential, you immediately get this relation that under the exchange of the first two and the last two indices of this uh, 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 stiffness tensor, you have a symmetry. And where it comes from is very simple, right? Because you can write out a potential for uh, a normal elastic solid, and the potential will be quadratic in the displacement, or in other words, in the strain tensor, 
Right? This is very much like a spring potential. And uh, the uh, proportionality between the square of the strain and the potential energy will be exactly this elastic stiffness tensor. Another way to say the same thing is that you can't extract work from a, you know, from in a closed cycle from a potential or a conservative system. And that's because um, this product of the elastic constant with uh, uij wedge ukl has to be zero where the wedge is by sort of definition by the way that you know stokes theorem works it's anti-symmetric right so the the property that uh, that would go beyond passive elasticity is precisely for this derivative of the stress with respect to the strain or the elastic constant to be anti-symmetric and this is what we called odd elasticity you know, odd precisely because of its anti-symmetry as well as its you know, unusual mechanical property. And of course, if you start out with an anti-symmetric stiffness tensor, then you immediately see that you cannot write out a potential energy. This quadratic form will always be zero, right? Your, um, the product of K zero a U and uh, a UIJ and UKL will be zero because uh, you can always exchange IJ and uh, KL here, right? Get a minus sign without actually changing the expression here. And if the expression is equal to its uh, negative, it has to be zero. But what you can do for this odd elasticity is instead define the work extracted from a closed cycle. And if you substitute this expression, right, the, the expression for the, the linear stress strain relation into the uh, work formula here, you get a sort of simple expression that tells you that for a linear odd elastic solid, the work extracted will only depend on the anti symmetric part of odd elasticity. So this is the new part, and uh, precisely because it can't be described by the potential, it uh, can lead to work extraction. All right, and so this, this argument for, you know, for work extraction can appear very abstract, right? It, uh, uh, as uh, I showed earlier, it can lead to uh, work extraction from a combination of, you know, two, uh, two types of shear strains. Um, and in that case, right, there's a specific modulus that you can introduce here, one of the odd elastic moduli, where you can uh, uh, evaluate uh, this work extraction integral. So what does this modulus do? Right. If you have a sort of a relation between, uh, uh, a, uh, if you want to extract work from two uh, a combination of two different shears. Well, so so first let me introduce to you the two different shears. Right. So one of the shear strains is uh, sort of the vertical or um, horizontal shear, right? They're the same up to a sign. And the other sort of independent shear in two dimensions, and from now on I'll be talking about two-dimensional systems for simplicity. Um, so in two-dimensional systems, you have sort of this uh, shear, uh, the second shear axis at 45 degrees, right? Where you take the corners of a square, and pull on them, right? So there's shear this way and shear this way. And what this K0, mod, one of the moduli of odd elasticity, which we call K0 does, is to, if you apply a strain along one of these axes, what it does is it produces a, uh, a stress inside of the solid that's rotated with respect to the applied strain. Right? 
So here you can see, so you can see the deformation here in, uh, in gray, but what you see in blue is the resulting stress. So stress is a combination of forces, right? Uh, uh, a constant stress is force balance, but they're forces acting against each other. And so you see that if you extend the solid this way, right, the response of the stress will be at 45 degrees, right? It will try to, you know, uh, it will try to contract in this direction and extend in this direction. And similarly here, right, it's a, in this case, this is an isotropic modulus because it doesn't matter which way you perform the shear, here too, everything is rotated by 45 degrees with exactly the same, uh, in, in the same direction, right? Um, so the proportionality constant is the same. Of course, it's, you have introduced this idea of chirality into the system because you have now introduced a sense of clockwise rotation versus anti-clockwise rotation. And another sort of shear modulus or another, um, uh, odd elastic modulus that you can introduce that is not a shear modulus is uh, 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 again introduces a chirality into the solid but in a different way. Right? So in this case, in this modulus, what happens is if you compress a solid, then you have a torque that acts on each individual element. Right? Torque is an, the anti-symmetric part of the stress tensor and for this response you uh, what you want is if you have isotropic compression then this anti-symmetric part of the stress or the torque is uh, uh, has you know is constant and non-zero and again that that distinguishes between clockwise or anti-clockwise rotation if you were to extend the solid put it under tension instead of compression you would have a torque in the opposite direction of course, I, I should say that you can do this while saying that, well, if you just rotate the solid, you don't uh, add any extra stress because that's the physical configuration. Uh, Anton, may I, yeah. uh, sorry for too many questions. No, no, no that's uh, it's a great. Uh, please. So we are not that much mechanical people, but more electromagnetic people. So I'm more familiar with non-reciprocity in electromagnetism and with breaking of Lorentz reciprocity. And there we know more or less well when the reciprocity is broken, either you apply magnetic field or the system is non-linear or non-equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So I wonder in case of your odd elasticity, are there some like universal theorems what has to be definitely yeah. broken or what is enough or what is sufficient for yeah. the elasticity? So I would say that, yes, yeah, so something like a magnetic field by itself, which doesn't, you know, add any energy to the system is insufficient, right? And that's precisely because you can extract work from, from the system, right? So you have, it has to be a system out of equilibrium. I think, I think that's one of the, uh, what are the clear uh, uh, consequences here? Uh, another, of course, another symmetry that has to be broken is the chiral symmetry, right? Because uh, in order to have this coupling, you know, rotated by 45 degrees, you have to very explicitly introduce a sense of chirality, a sense of clockwise versus anti-clockwise rotation. So I think, uh, as far as I'm aware, those two, uh, uh, symmetries in combination, right? Non-equilibrium and chiral um, would be would be sufficient, at least in two dimensions. In three dimensions, actually, in order to have something, um, uh, you actually also need a sense of an axis, right? In order to to define this rotation by forty-five degrees. So, in three dimensions, you also need to be anisotropic in order to have this. And in one D, it's just impossible, right? Yeah, in one D it's impossible because you will always any function you can write out in one D is the derivative of some other function, right? So there isn't this idea of a curl force. All right, so let me go through since I, since I introduced this cycle in the beginning and haven't explained it yet. 
let me go through it in a little bit more detail now before uh, I sort of conclude with some of the interesting phenomena. So here, what you see in this cycle is that you have a combination of these two shear, shear strains that lead to work extraction. And the key, as I mentioned, is to enclose a, an area in this shear space. And the way that you can do this is that you first apply a shear along shear one, right? But then you don't undo that shear right away. Instead, you apply the second shear afterwards, right? And so you have here in the opposite corner, you have a combination of both of these shear deformations, right? And then what you do once you're in this corner is not to go back and undo the previous shear, but undo the first shear, right? So you have a combination of these two shears, and now you undo this shear to go, to go back to a, a, uh, a uh, configuration like this, right, where you only have shear two, and then you bring it back, right? So there is this sense of, uh, you know, path dependence or, you know, uh, dependence on the order of operations in which you perform the shear that let you um, uh, extract work, that let you enclose an area in uh, uh, strain space. And the work that you extract, if you were to substitute th this uh, combination of action into this integral for the work that uh, I wrote out earlier, the work that you extract will be uh, proportional to the area that you've enclosed and proportional to this odd elastic modulus, right? So in fact, the work is twice this odd elastic modulus that couples the, you know, the shear uh, stress and uh, uh, strain uh, uh, times the area in close. And the interesting thing here is that this work is, extra it's not just that you've extracted the work, right, but it's uh, the cycle that you've used to extract it is quasi-static, right? There's nothing rate dependent here about how work has been extracted, which is you know, different than a lot of the engines that we're used to, where it's the rates that, uh, that matter. And in particular, if you were to only have a one-dimensional piston, the only way you, could, you would be able to extract work from that is to have some sort of an asymmetry right in the rate between you know, things going forwards or backwards. So one of the interesting things about this, this quasi-static cycle is that you can actually make it in, inside of a single solid without applying external forces by looking at the dynamics of the solid. So now I'm, uh, you know, I've gone from just thinking about the stress-strain relation into thinking about dynamics, so I need some sort of a, you know, dynamic equation, some, some sort of uh, equivalent of, uh, you know, Newton's law that uh, force is equal to mass times acceleration. But I'm not going to use Newton's law. Uh, I'm going to uh, 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 do something a little bit simpler, which is to say, well, I'm going to take the solid and immerse it into a very viscous fluid, right? So that um, the forces, which are the gradients of the stress, are actually proportional to the velocities of the particle, right? And the inertia doesn't matter. And the reason I'm going to do this is because then you can balance the work extracted during a single cycle against the energy dissipated and get this propagation of waves. Here, this is a, 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 a way to illustrate what uh, this wave looks like. Um, and this wave will, will propagate and self-sustain without having inertia. So this is something special about these odd elastic solid because usually these elastodynamic waves rely crucially on the idea of inertia, right? And they balance inertia against you know, the compressional and the shear modulus of the solid, right? These are what are, uh, what are called the acoustic phonons in, inside of the solid. But here we have neither 
you know, shear or elastic moduli that I'm considering here, or, you know, uh, shear or bulk modulus. Instead, I only have the, these odd modulus, and I don't have any inertia. But nevertheless, these, this dissipative effect balances against, uh, against these odd elastic moduli to give you uh, uh, self-sustained waves. One of the interesting thing about these waves is that their dispersion relation is, uh, is quite different than, than normal elastic waves. And the way that you can get the dispersion relation is by thinking about the balance between uh, the power injected into this material by the activity. This is proportional to the uh, elastic modulus and it has twice the, uh, the wave number squared here and you can think about the power dissipated from this term right so this is from this term you have one derivative on the stress and another uh inside of the stress uh due to the relation between stress and uh, uh strain um and uh, you have uh you're balancing this against power dissipated which is this side right you now have a displacement times a time derivative. So this is the frequency times the uh, dissipation uh, uh, rate. And so solving these, right, balancing them and solving them, we get the dispersion relation of this waves, which is dispersive, right? This is not like a normal sound mode where the frequency is proportional to the wave number. Instead, the frequency is proportional to the square of the wave number um, in, uh, uh, in uh, this material. Uh, Anton, very maybe unrelated analogy, but if you just have a membrane and yeah. you consider flexural vibrations of a membrane, mm. so like a graphene flake or whatever, just yeah. a rubber sheet, but out of plane vibrations, it also yeah. has quadratic dispersion law. So I yeah, wonder, it does. maybe it it's does. unrelated, but... I, I, as, uh, I, 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 I do know this bending modulus thing. I, I don't know of any, of sort of any analogy that you could make because this is, you know, so out of equilibrium, right? Where sort of the flexural waves are very equilibrium. Uh, but yeah, it, it is the same, right? In, in that way. Um, so you can describe, you know, a single cycle here, right? Uh, of this wave, this is sort of how the, wave proceeds in time, right? When it's self-sustained and you can make a phase diagram of these waves by considering, so now a combination of normal spring constants, right? And therefore uh, normal, you know, bulk and shear moduli, as well as these, uh, you know, new moduli A and K0 that I introduced for odd elasticity. And there are several regions in particular you see that for small odd elastic moduli uh, relative to the normal moduli, right? Essentially, the normal moduli, if you consider them in combination with uh, dissipation, they attenuate these waves. And there's a specific point, right? There's a sharp transition where these waves are completely attenuated, and this is a line of exceptional points. Right, so this is a phenomenon where your frequencies go from being real frequencies for high activity, right, for high odd elastic constants, to imaginary frequencies here. And imaginary frequencies means exponential decay in time. And uh, uh, so uh, 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 no propagating waves. So this is a phase diagram in uh, terms of the phenomena associated with the, uh, uh, with the waves in the solid. And then um, uh, to, yeah, let me, let me wrap this up by saying, so, so this is one set of phenomena, right? The wave propagation is a set of phenomena that you could, where you could measure this uh, uh, odd elasticity, not by looking at um, just the work extracted, right? But by imaging, the material and looking at the dispersion of, uh, of waves as a function of wave number. But uh, there's also another way to, uh, to measure this odd elasticity without 
even looking at the dynamics at all. So not trying to measure the work, but also not trying to measure the dynamics. And this is the elastostatic response, right? So there are all sorts of interesting um, uh, kind of elastostatic phenomena that one can look at. And uh, one, one particular one that people in the metamaterial community have been somewhat obsessed about is this negative Poisson ratio, right? This is a material that you can build. This is just one example where if you uniactually contract the material in one direction, it will contract in the perpendicular direction instead of expanding, right? So we're used to materials expanding in the direction perpendicular to stress, but here it's contracting. And it turns out that uh, you can get a negative Poisson ratio in, in this odd elastic material, but there's an extra sort of phenomenon, what you could call the odd ratio, that you can get from odd elasticity that, that doesn't exist in an equilibrium solid. Right? And so the way that I would describe the odd ratio is in terms of this coupling between the two, uh, the two shear axes, right? So you take a material, you compress it in one direction, right? This is, this is the direction in which you're compressing it vertically. And then the response of the material won't be just, you know, transverse. It will also be a shear at 45 degrees, right? So you compress it vertically and then it will sort of slip out of the, out of the vertical. And the degree to which it slips, right, this angle by which it uh, deviates from vertical, you can call the odd ratio. And this is a diagram, you know, decomposing the forces that you can uh, read about in our paper um, that uh, uh, lets you see why the odd ratio is there. Essentially, odd elasticity creates by coupling the two shear axes, the odd elasticity creates a shear at 45 degrees, which then needs to be balanced by normal elastic forces. And in order to have a static configuration, uh, you need this full balance. So as a couple of, uh, to, to briefly conclude, uh, first of all, I mentioned this idea of work extraction, right? And that this formula is very general for uh, you know, any stress-strain relation, right? But of course, in, uh, for odd elasticity, the, you know, I've only given you one example of how to extract work, and it's a very different example than, say, the muscle that I uh, introduced earlier, right? The muscle doesn't have odd, odd elasticity as far as we know because all of the forces, all of the active forces, are along the direction of the strain. And so uh, something that people haven't done, something that I'm interested in, is to apply this formula sort of more generally to try to look at other mechanisms by which work can be extracted from uh, non, uh, um, uh, uh, from active or non-reciprocal forces. And finally, uh, I wanted to play to you this, uh, this clip from the uh, film Black Panther where I, that I think shows off uh, uh, one, of the, one of the ways in which maybe odd elasticity can be, can be thought about. So, so this Black Panther has this suit and what happens is that you, uh, when you shoot at this suit or when you uh, strain it mechanically, right, it keeps some of its energy, right? And then you can use this energy to perform work on the environment, which is exactly the physics that, uh, uh, that I was describing today. So this idea of storing energy inside of a material uh, and releasing it later is exactly the physics of odd elasticity. So on that note, uh, I welcome any more of your questions and I hope you enjoyed my talk. Thank you, Anton. Uh, so the talk is open for questions. Uh, let me start maybe with the first one. Uh, so you okay. described this interesting dynamics when uh, the energy of the active matter uh, is like balanced by the dissipation. So I yes. wonder if, if we speak about some realistic realizations, uh, how, how many particles you basically need with those, those motors 
to, to realize, to detect some signatures of that dynamics? That's a very good question. So we think, you know, uh, I guess our description is sort of in the thermodynamic limit, which is probably not, you know, realistic to do with my macroscopic motors. Uh, but <clears throat> turns out that, you know, for a lot of systems, uh, just uh, having, you know, of order, say, 10 particles per side, right, is enough to at least some of the phenomena associated with uh, with continuum mechanics to be extracted. And since all of the physics is already contained in the single spring, I think as far as, you know, as far as this uh, idea of uh, elastic waves, you actually, you don't need, you know, uh, Avogadro's number of springs, but, you know, uh, maybe hundreds uh, for, uh, uh, for two-dimensional material. Okay, thank you. Some other questions, please? Uh, Anton, can you do it with optomechanics? Like you take some mm -hmm. normal material, mm -hmm. uh, you shine light on it, and then magic happens and it gets hot elasticity. Uh, That's a very good that? question. So, you know, I first of all, I'm very much not an expert on optomechanics, and I gave, an, you know, a, 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 the example of, uh, of these scroll forces and optics that I actually know very little about. Uh, uh, because that's just not my area of expertise. Um, one sort of uh, idea I had that's maybe a little bit out there that at least I don't know of anybody who can realize it is to have two chiral particles, right? So let's say two sort of gear like uh, uh, particles that have a chirality uh, uh, next to each other and you shine light on them, right? And the light that scatters off of this particle, right, has a certain chirality that then exerts optical forces on this particle, right? Ah, then but I it's think, like, uh, yeah, right? because there are these optical binding forces. I think if Misha Petrov is here, he knows much more. So you have like optical forces between two particles. Yeah. But yeah. I have no idea if anybody considered this for chiral particles. Maybe yeah, yeah. they will be. The issue is that they, uh, from what I understand, is that, you know, just orders of magnitude, they seem to be very small, right? These, this for, you know, the, the type of chiral forces that you would get would be very small. Uh, but but it, it doesn't seem sort of outside of, you know, realm of uh, possibility at least thought experiments. Yeah, if you don't have normal springs, if you only have optical spring between particles, and then you start playing with chirality, Indeed, why not? I don't know. Yeah, why, why not? Yeah. I mean, it would be really fascinating to me. And again, it's uh, probably not an area that I can really comment on. Yeah, but we could uh, discuss it further. Yeah. That's, that's very beautiful. Okay, so some other questions uh, from the audience. Okay, if not, then uh, let's thank uh, our speaker once again. Thank you, Anton. Thanks for thank keeping you. Your time thank you. as well. Yeah. yeah thank you. So uh, let me announce the next seminar. Uh, the next talk will be given by two people, uh, Gulnas Rahmanova, uh, with the topic uh, uh, plasma and polarity from a helical state in Dirac magnet, and also the talk from Stanislav Kolodny, a PhD student of Ivan Yorsh. So that's the plan for the next seminar. And with that, I thank all of you for participation. Have a good week. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, listening. Thanks a lot.